Hi, Laura Law, can you hear me? I can hear you. This is Jim Thomas. Excellent, Jim. Laura Lai has been uh, struggling to keep her connection, which is unfortunate because she's our go-to expert on all things blue jeans. Great. I see your screen. And it's the right screen, the full screen, rather than? It is the full screen. Cool, thank you. So we'll hold on just one minute and then get started. I put a chat in um, asking users if they could filter their Q&A so that they see only unanswered questions. Um, if that doesn't work, uh, um, then we'll just have to delete questions that are being answered so that we don't fill the, fill the queue. I say that out loud in case anybody wants to answer that in chat. Okay, I have the time as 11.05. Uh, I think we should get back started so we don't lose any more time off the schedule. Um, after that excellent discussion, um, we'll now move on to hear from Jim Thomas uh, with the perspective uh, from NSF. Okay, good morning everyone and thank you for the opportunity to give you a brief report from the National Science Foundation. So mostly I'll give you some news and bits of progress as seen from Arlington, excuse me, from Alexandria, Virginia. Um, so the NSF is functioning normally, almost, the good news. In particular, there's some news to share with you. We have a new director for the National Science Foundation, Seth Panchanathan. Uh, he is currently the executive vice president at Arizona State University and a professor of computer science. Uh, he was confirmed by the House and Senate just last Thursday, and so we are waiting for the president's signature before it, he becomes the actual director of the National Science Foundation. But we're anticipating that that will happen very soon. Um, his background is that not only has he been very active at the University of Arizona, but he's also uh, been uh, on the National Science Board, which is the advisory board for the National Science Foundation. He was nominated to that position by President Obama in 2014. He was nominated by President Trump to head the NSF on December 18th. And uh, due to the COVID crisis, things are a little bit del delayed, but uh, the, uh, uh, we're basically through through that process waiting for the pres presidential signature and he'll be director for six years bringing some stability to uh, the long-term outlook at the foundation. The outgoing director is France Cordova, who did an outstanding job. We were unfortunately unable to give her an in-person send-off due to the pandemic, uh, but hopefully we'll have an opportunity to do that in September. Um, there was a bit of an interlude between directors, and so the acting director was actually Kevin Drogemeyer, who was also, act, uh, also the um, head of OSTP. Uh, there were a couple other important uh, senior management changes within mathematical and physical sciences. Ann Kinney, who some of you may know, has taken on a very important position at NASA. And Sean Jones, her deputy, is acting as the assistant director for mathematical and physical sciences. And Sean is a bundle of energy and a great person to know if you haven't met him already. So, wow, what a year. Um, the stories from the National Science Foundation are similar to the stories that you've already heard this morning from Jefferson Lab and even the DOE. NSF is in the Commonwealth of Virginia, and so many of the timelines are very, very similar to what you're experiencing at Jefferson Lab. Uh, the actual building was closed on March 23rd, 
And like our professional society meetings and even this meeting, NSF panels and other reviews have been conducted virtually since that time. And travel has been, been suspended for the foreseeable future. So uh, no travel in and out of Alexandria uh, for anyone um, for we're not sure how long. Uh, we have reported to our administration that we're 100% efficient. And so they responded, oh, so there's no hurry to reopen the building. And one can only give out a deep sigh in response to that. Uh, we don't know what the timeline will be for reopening the building. We do. Um, NSF management has developed a, f a phased structure, like all other organizations, for reopening. We're in phase one. Uh, there is a phase two and phase three, but uh, no timeline has been given to that yet. I do want to say thank you to everyone who has participated in the NSF reviews, uh, because it's it's actually a um, considerable amount of extra work uh, to, to, to document things carefully enough that you can do peer review uh, virtually. Um, but uh, we've been in this, we expect to be in this mode for a little while. And if you have suggestions on how we can make the process better, uh, your thoughts are very welcome. Please direct them to me or to my colleague, Elena Opper, who many of you know. Um, NSF has been responding to the crisis in many different ways. We have been attempting to find administrative relief uh, and allowability of costs and even due date extensions. These things are possible, just ask. We will see if we can work with you. Um, there's also, uh, it is possible to repurpose federal funds. And just to give a, a trivial black and white example, suppose you happen to have a, a, a crate full of N95 masks in your laboratory, you can donate them to the local hospital. That is fully allowed, fully allowed, even though you use federal funds to purchase them. Um, and then a more direct response from the NSF has been rapid proposals. Rapid is actually an acronym, but it's also meant to indicate that it's something that can be approved very quickly. Um, there were funds dedicated to support COVID response, non-medical research. So this would be perhaps database activities or uh, other, other things that we non-medical scientists can contribute to the community. Uh, 717 awards have gone out to the community for uh, that kind of research. Uh, the scientific community worldwide is slowly opening up around the world. Uh, we heard the story this morning uh, from Stuart Henderson about Jefferson Lab uh, ha has limited on-site operations for select staff and users with uh, very imminent prospects for returning to uh, accelerator operations. At Brookhaven Lab, Rick Beams are actually already up just this week, uh, and they're doing it in an interesting way where uh, it's essential personnel and the users who happen to live on Long Island are also welcome to participate. That's a theme that echoes around the world with the Paul Scher Institute, where the NSF has projects. Uh, this a PSI is open and accessible to Swiss citizens and a few uh, non-Swiss citizens who happen to be living in close proximity to the laboratory. Also, the Gran Sasso is ac accessible to essential personnel, mostly Italians but again, users who are in residence. Um, a large facility for the NSF is the National Superconducting Cyclotron Laboratory, NSCL at MSU. And this is also open to essential personnel. Uh, NS NSCL suspended their operations on March 23rd, um, but they resumed uh, their user program on May 29th under very special circumstances, a very rigorous control over PPE uh, self-distancing rules. Uh, they've really done an outstanding job of coordinating the, those um, health and safety guidelines it, for the users. Uh, the first experiments actually resumed at NSCL in mid-June, and their construction activities also resumed at the same time. So, for example, the TACAR spectrometer, which is a very important part of the future of the facility, and the RIA-6 projects are underway with essential personnel. Not quite moving at full speed, uh, but at least uh, making good progress towards getting back to normal activities. They are, of course, incurring extraordinary expenses, and the university has been very helpful, and also the NSF is attempting to help uh, with some of those extraordinary, extraordinary expenses. Uh, just the PPE, for example, uh, $100,000 expenses going into that. Um, I do want to underline that there are no new appropriations uh, 
so that the NSF will attempt to help uh, with some of these issues, but there, there's no new money. So anything we help comes out of the base science program. Uh, so those are the trade-offs that we have to consider. Um, NSCL and other labs that I'm aware of are not expecting to recover all of the lost bean time that has been incurred during this time, although everyone is working as hard as they can to uh, extend the scientific programs and make them as rich and as full as possible. So the specific example I'll give you is to continue with NSCL. As many of you know, in fiscal year 22, uh, it transitions over to being FRIB and a, it will be a DOE managed laboratory at that point. Currently, it's an NSF managed laboratory and we meet regularly, uh, teams back and forth, trying to make for a smooth transition and all indications in my office anyway are that the transition is moving very smoothly. Um, the coupled cyclotrons will continue to run for a while, uh, but they will not run right up until uh, the start of FRIB operations. So there will actually be an interlude of about nine months where uh, we're anticipating uh, RIAS 3 and RIAS 6 operation, um, operations. The RIA stands for reaccelerated beams. So it's an opportunity to using limited apparatus at NSCL uh, to reaccelerate uh, uh, exotic uh, ion beams and do uh, nuclear physics experiments. They've had a pack associated with the Rio program where they considered 31 proposals, 13 have been approved, uh, representing about 4,000 hours of runtime before the COVID pandemic hit, and the actual run schedule is a work in progress. So we're communicating with them on a regular basis to try and figure out just how much of this program we can actually run while maintaining our schedule with respect to FRIB construction. So an example from around the world and which should be of interest to this audience, the MUSE experiment at the Paul Scherer Institute, uh, they are addressing the proton radius problem. And up until recently, of course, uh, there was some tension between the atomic measurements in uh, the proton radius due to uh, muonic hydrogen as compared to electronic hydrogen. And so the MUSE experiment uh, has been busily assembling itself to do, and the goal is to do a precise comparison of EP and UP scattering in the same apparatus. And uh, PSI is one of the very few places in the world where you can actually do this. And just so you know what they're up to, uh, they're planning to actually take data approximately 20 weeks in calendar years 20 and 21. And their goal is to get the cross section for elastic scattering of muons and electrons at sort of the 1% level. So look, very much looking forward to the results from MUSE and also looking forward to the talk later today about the amazing shrinking proton. Um, Florida State University has a university-based uh, laboratory uh, for doing nuclear structure studies and nuclear astrophysics. And the news from Florida State is that they've finished now and completed and commissioned uh, the upgrade of the Yale Super Angie split pole uh, they've actually been able to extend the capabilities of the facility quite substantially from the Yale days. For anyone who might remember that, um, it uh, was commissioned last summer, and they're doing the. They started on their first full scientific program uh, before the COVID uh, crisis hit. But uh, the commissioning studies were really fantastic. Uh, they did a series of DP reactions, which are good for calibrations uh, and measuring performance. They got 20 keV resolution on the plot on the right shows you DP scattering on titanium-50. So really exquisite resolution there, the various resonances. Uh, LEGEND 200 is a double beta decay experiment in the Gran Sasso Laboratory, uh, funded by both the National Science Foundation and the Department of Energy. And the goal here is to take enriched germanium-76 from prior experiments, add it add new material for a total mass of approximately 200 kilograms of enriched germanium-76. Sensitivity goal here is a uh, half-life of greater than 10 to the 27th year, 27 years, uh, or a neutrino mass limit of approximately 50 milli electron volts. And uh, Gran Sasso shut down due to the COVID epidemic, but uh, it j just beginning to start up uh, the status for the experiment is they've procured all of the material and they're busily fabricating detectors 
and uh, we'll start installation of the new detectors relatively soon. Uh, again, exact schedules are still being worked out. But one of the wonderful things that happened uh, with Legend 200 is that we demonstrated the creativity of scientists and engineers to respond to the crisis. Uh, and you just can't keep us from being productive is what it boils down to. Um, we've heard examples of engineers who have built uh, entire integrated circuit design laboratories in their basements based on a home computer and a personal budget. Done some truly amazing things. But the example I want to show you today uh, has to do with uh, a postdoctoral fellow at UNC, uh, Eric Martin, was faced with the problem that uh, Legend needed some braided cables to read out the, the germanium crystals. So they need to take four cables and braid them together. Um, and the laboratory, of course, was closed. And so he had a 3D printer at home and built his own braiding apparatus. And the beautiful thing about this is due to the slow speed operations and the materials involved, there's no lubrication. It's an extreme, extremely clean apparatus. And each of these cables is about the diameter of monofilament, monofilament fishing line. And that's the example you saw in the movie. And hopefully there was enough bandwidth that you could see uh, Eric's apparatus in motion. So uh, lots of creative ways responding to the crisis, uh, remaining our productivity. And uh, so now I want to just turn my attention to talking a little bit about the review process of the National Science Foundation, mention a few opportunities for funding and to give you some of the deadline. But with that, so the NSF responds to proposals. Um, you can propose essentially anything you want um, and we will respond to it. Um, it comes from a community of experts from large universities and even small colleges. And one of the ways that we can deal with that wide range of opportunities is to, <clears throat> we have two review criteria, intellectual merit and broader impacts. And intellectual merit is the sort of thing that goes into phys physical review letter. We are all highly trained in uh, high quality uh, intellectual merit. Broader impacts are unique to the National Science Foundation where we actually encourage principal investigators to get involved with education and outreach. But also there's a large range of activities that qualify as broader impacts. Um, building the economy of the future, building the workforce of the future, uh, broadening participation of underrepresented groups, um, national security, uh, many, many of our activities are, have applications in the national security sector. All those are reasonable broader impact. When you write a proposal, there is no prescription and waiting between intellectual merit and broader impacts. But uh, if you have a clever and original um, broader impact section in your uh, proposal, uh, you will, will be rewarded for that. So there are bonus points associated with having broader impacts that are creative. And finally, thank you to everyone who participated in the review of the proposals that came in for fiscal year 20 and sat on our virtual panels. Um, it was extra effort. Many people were in unusual time zones to make that possible. So thank you very much. COVID-19 crisis is not over, but we really do want to thank you for the fact that it, uh, how quickly you worked and, and kept the deadlines. So let me review a few funding opportunities. I won't go into great detail, uh, but I do want to highlight just a couple. Uh, probably the most important one is the career program. So this is for young faculty. I'll have a slide on this in a moment, but the note is that those are due July 27th. That's our fastest timeline and everything I will talk about. There are also opportunities to broaden diversity through co-funding that I won't talk about in any detail, but AGAP is an opportunity for graduate students. EPSCoR is for geographic diversity. So states that don't traditionally have lots of NSF or DOE or other federal funding, and also historically black colleges and universities. Uh, ask me about those opportunities if you're interested. Uh, but let me turn to the standard grants because that's where uh, most of our proposals come in. Um, there's a new solicitation numbers, 20-580. Uh, for those who are going to participate, please read it carefully because there's lots of fine print this year. Um, these proposals are due the first Tuesday in December. That's the traditional formula, and that translates to December 1st uh, in 2020. 
Um, these solicitations also, the solicitation 20-580 also includes proposals for mid-scale instrumentation. So if you're interested in building instrumentation in the $4 million to $15 million range, there are opportunities for a non-renewable one-time grant to do that. Uh, these proposals are solicited annually at the same time as a standard grant. So again, December 1 is your deadline. And this is for the construction or acquisition of instrumentation. It's not so much for early R&D. It's expected that the base program will do that. So this is to actually construct equipment. Um, and then one other final word I wanted to say about standard grants is that everybody has to fill out what we call collaborators and other affiliates. It's a template. Uh, the way we actually use it is we, we're looking for conflicts of interest in reviewing your proposals. We want experts to look at your proposal and give us guidance, but at the same time, we don't want it to be your best friend. Now, for large collaborations, such as you find at Jefferson Lab or at CERN, uh, it's important that you not list everyone in the collaboration. Suppose you worked at Atlas, just to choose a silly example. It would then be essentially impossible for us to find an expert to review re your re proposal. So please just give us the people who are in your working group, people you work with on a daily basis, people you actually write a paper with. If you're the spokesperson, you probably include the entire collaboration. But if you're just a participant in a collaboration, or a working group leader, please just give us a reference to your working group, and that will make the job of choosing referees much easier. I talked about the career program. This is the Faculty Early Career Development Program at the National Science Foundation. Um, this is, has a particular twist to it, again, uh, leaning on the fact that NSF proposals have two categories, intellectual merit and broader impacts, the career program puts extra special emphasis on leadership and education. So we are looking for creativity in terms of educational activities, often very tightly integrated with a research program. So for example, if you're building a calorimeter for a large experiment and you need a small army of undergraduates, there are two ways to deal with that. You could treat them as slaves, or you could develop an educational program around the, their labor on the calorimeter. So you could have workshops talking about uh, radiation in solid materials. Um, summer programs, uh, you could all, do all sorts of creative educational things as part of building your team, and that would make a wonderful career proposal. Um, these are five-year awards, and the deadline is third Friday in July, which this year translates into July 27th, 2020. Okay, uh, if you're interested in uh, research instrumentation, uh, there are MRIs, which range from anywhere from $100,000 to $4 million. Uh, there are actually two tracks, and there's a free competition at your university, uh, and only one will actually be submitted to the NSF if you're in the $1 million to $4 million category. Deadline for those is actually a window. It's January 1 to 19, and there is an expectation of 30% cost share from your university if you're a PhD granting institution. If you're not a PhD in granting institution, it is not necessary to do the cost share. Um, and just be aware that it's competitive process, as always, and awards above a million dollars will compete across the entire foundation. Uh, there are bigger categories, which I won't go into in great detail, but please ask me if you have a project in the range from six million to 20 million, or what we call uh, mid-scale research, research infrastructure to 20 million to 70 million dollar range. Uh, the solicitations for them are, be, are being written as we speak, uh, so please watch for updates if you have a very large project. Uh, these will be uh, a two-step process. Uh, first of all, these proposals are only solicited every other year, but also uh, there will be a letter of invitation, uh, excuse me, a uh, Pre-proposals will be requested in the fall, and then invitation only for full proposals after that. So if you, if you have a very large program, uh, please contact me for additional details, but also watch for the updated solicitations. A word to, of wisdom, however, is that if you choose to compute, compete for one of these larger instrumentation awards, be ready to comp compete against uh, very a creative programs such as LIGO or the Event Horizon Telescope. You're competing against the entire 
National Science Foundation to pursue these activities. Now, let me turn my attention to some changes in the IT structure at the National Science Foundation. Many people have suggested that we change the system, and there's a lot of inertia there. Uh, but a few things are, in fact, happening. Fastlane and research.gov are the preferred ways to submit proposals to the NSF. They were both designed in the last century. And one of the not so amusing characteristics of Fastlane is that it used a character set from the 1980s. And uh, when you cut and paste from Microsoft Word into Fastlane, you get all sorts of question marks. That basic character set has been changed. You'll be happy to know. Uh, the other interesting thing that's going on that's being led by our computer information science and engineering division is called SIZE. Uh, they're exploring the use of artificial intelligence in reviewing proposals. Um, and this is being used to a greater and greater extent, uh, especially in the processing of AI uh, proposals. Uh, they're changing the templates. Uh, so when you submit your proposals for nuclear physics standard grants, for example, your bio sketch has changed and also your pending support pages have changed. So watch for those change. Watch for those updates. Don't do it the way you did last year because they're subtle changes to make these things more machine readable. Now, if you want to have a humorous and dark thought, think about this. Over in the, the computer information division at the National Science Foundation, we now have AI funding AI. So before long, humans won't be needed in their process at all. Now, that's meant as a joke. Uh, hopefully, uh, people will be involved for a long time. All right, let me turn to the budget and let me do this, see if I can do this in one minute. Uh, the nuclear physics budget highlighted by uh, the big arrow that says flat indicates that the standard grant program basically has been very flat. The creativity and their growth is over on the mid scale on the far right. Or I didn't give you an arrow, but it's the second from the right. Uh, you can see that we're fairly successful on those various instrumentation mid scale programs. But those are, there's nothing guaranteed about those. Those compete foundation wide. In terms of the fiscal year 20 budget, it was an interesting process. Um, so you're seeing the enacted amount is the reference, but the request from the president's office was a bit of a low bid, down 12%. And then the Senate and the House responded, and ultimately it was up about 3%. Um, so it is very typical. The president makes a low bid, the House and Senate respond, and then we have to be patient to see what develops. Now, in terms of the FY21 budget, we've started this process. The president's uh, budget is down 6% for the NSF as a total. Uh, it propagates through the system, not exactly in those numbers, and we are currently waiting for the House and Senate to respond. So let me leave you with some parting words. Do good science. You are the experts. Be mindful of your implicit biases. We all have them. Broaden participation. Make an impact on society through education and outreach. When possible, open your lab to the community. But most especially, talk to your neighbors, talk to everyone who will listen to you, and talk to young people. Uh, the 10-year-old who lives next door is very impressionable. And when he or she grows up to be president, they will remember the words that you shared with them when they were 10. And finally, acknowledge your funding agencies in your publication box. And with that, I will conclude and answer any questions. And if there's anything you would like to take offline, um, my last slide gives you the, our contacts, Bogdan Mahela, Nuclear Theory, and then Alina Opper and I handle the experimental program. And that's it, back to you, Kent. Excellent, thank you. Um, yeah, thanks for the contact information. Also, the uh, I think your slides have now been moved and will be either are or will soon be posted. Um, just looking at the Q and A, uh, Nilonga Leonaga is asking um, uh, about the MRI program not having any <clears throat> sort of uh, direct path or, or obvious path to getting R and D funding. For, for you suggest, uh, um, you know, calling back to a recent well reviewed. Uh, MRI that he um, uh, put in, but came back with reviews that were very positive, but also said that it may be too ambitious or risky and funding should follow a demonstration of the basic device. So he's wondering if there's some sort of system where one can get, you know, 50, 100K or something of R&D funding to get these things started. 
Um, I can only say that there, there is no explicit mechanism for R&D at the small scale level. It is anticipated that it will come through the base program uh, as part of a standard grant proposal. Um, there, the MRI actually does allow for uh, second level uh, R&D. So the initial, most initial stages are typically not in an MRI, but um, what you would, I guess, call preconceptual engineering uh, actually can be built into MRI. So the boundary there is, in fact, a little bit fuzzy, and the longest comment is, in fact, very accurate that it's a, uh, because it's fuzzy, it's, it's a little hard to transition. But the real starting point is with in the base program with a traditional standard grant. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll just mention um, also appearing in the Q&A as a comment that the uh, uh, even even in just um, uh, referring to to graduate students as slaves is um, in the current environment. Uh, <laughs> Is, is My quite fraught. Um, so, Understood. Yeah, just, Understood. I would Understood. mention that. Yeah. Um, My uh, uh, all right. The, the 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 census of course taken. But uh, so uh, are we? Um, I don't know if we have other questions coming up in the Q and A. Um, uh, uh, we don't. I don't see anything else coming up. I appreciate the the presentation. We're um, still pressed on time, so I think maybe we'll. Uh, move on to the next talk. Thanks, Jim, very much. Appreciate that. Um, and let's see if we can get Bob uh, to start sharing his slides. We should. Guess we'll be applauding. Uh, ah, Bob, I see you. Yeah, I think I tested this during the break and it worked. So let's hope. Go. Three. I'm seeing Jim's right. slides. See that okay? Mm, yes. Now it's updated to yours. Uh, do you want to put that on his full screen? There we go. We got it. So I'm going to get out of the way and let you give your presentation. Okay. Thank you, Kent. Uh, it's uh, a pleasure to uh, be here, such as it is, and to uh, have the opportunity to uh, give this presentation to all of you. The user group meeting this. Uh, uh, so I'll cover some recent highlights, uh, a little bit about the 12 GV program and the PAC, future projects, uh, computing initiatives, and a summary. So uh, the uh, um, uh, reporting of results in nature for the Jefferson Lab program continues. Um, there was the, uh, the PRAD uh, proton radius experiment, which you will hear more about later, uh, was published um, last year. And uh, I note here uh, that the particle beta group has actually adopted the PRAD result for EP scattering and does not consider any of the previously published results in their new average which is a radius of 0 0.841. So I think that's a, you know, this PRAS result is having a substantial impact. And so that's very interesting. Um, from the 6GEV program, uh, there was this uh, paper uh, just came out recently in Nature on uh, carbon 12 EE prime P in class uh, and uh, measurement of the uh, momentum distribution in carbon, uh, very excellent agreement with the argon AB18 potential. Uh, we also had a nature physics uh, article, deeply virtual compton scattering off the neutron, all A um, And very recently, just a few weeks ago, the Primex uh, result came out in science. Uh, and this is the final result from the two phases of the Primex experiment. Um, and they see this measurement of the neutral pion lifetime. Uh, and they see uh, excellent agreement with the chiral anomaly calculation. The next to leading order, or next to next to leading order, uh, corrections to that uh, would indicate a slight increase in the width and uh, that's not well supported by the data. So there seems to be a little tension there. 
but uh, it's a very nice experimental result and very happy to see that come out. Um, something you may be less familiar with, um, our uh, SRF group has uh, successfully demonstrated what's called a conduction-cooled SRF cavity. So this is a, a, a single-cell copper cavity coated with niobium on the inside and then coated with niobium-310, which is an alloy that has a, a higher uh, transition temperature and also a much higher critical field. So um, this uh, material can be run at 4 degrees Kelvin as opposed to traditionally like CBAP is at 2 degrees Kelvin requires much more substantial refrigeration, cryogenic refrigeration plant. You can basically buy a, a cryocooler uh, that will go down to 4 degrees Kelvin. Uh, it doesn't have any liquid helium in it. Uh, and so um, this now, uh, this was successfully operated, this cavity, 5 watts with 6.5 million uh, volts per meter, which is, you know, less than the state of the art in pure niobium at 2K, but still quite respectable. Uh, and uh, so this is really a major step towards compact, low-cost accelerators for application, industry, medicine, or university-scale research. They, they published this very recently in Superconducting Science and Technology. Um, there was actually a, a similar work, uh, not exactly the same, at uh, Fermilab. So this is a subject that's I think we're going to see kind of a, a revolution in accelerator technology going forward now. It's uh, very nice. So the 12 GeV science era uh, was in full swing until uh, a few weeks ago. Um, and I just want to show some things here. Hall A, of course, completed the tritium family of experiments. And I want to highlight that they uh, had two uh, publications uh, recently from uh, the uh, EE prime P on tritium and helium-3, uh, this shows ratio of this plot. Um, and uh, we completed running APEX, the uh, search for heavy photons, and uh, PREX was recently completed. And we, are, uh, we were running CREX before the interruption by the COVID-19. Uh, in Hall B, the first phase of the run groups A and B are completed. Complete PRAD results published in Nature. I already covered that. In the heavy photon search, uh, the, the amount of running that was planned for 2019 actually was completed. Um, and uh, they're uh, working very hard on uh, analysis of Flash 12 data. Um, but they did manage to publish uh, an extensive series of NIM articles on uh, the uh, Class 12 uh, device. So this is a very nice publication. Uh, Hall C, we've got 5.9 experiments completed, um, F2D over F2P, you can see results on the right there, the E to H ratios at high X coming out, and I think we're preparing a publication. Uh, the search for the LHCB pentaquark, I have a slide on that, and uh, the A1N running was uh, complete. Um, Paul D finished uh, Glue X Phase 1, Threshold J Psi was published in PRL, um, and the Dirk enhancement is complete, and they have begun running Phase 2 with, with the Dirk uh, operating very well to the commission. So the Pentaquarks, uh, last year LHCB published another paper. Uh, with uh, more details on the pentaquarks uh, with uh, in, in a JSI production. And uh, you can see on the right the uh, spectrum there as a function of the mass. Uh, and um, GUX last year published in PRL, uh, the uh, graph on the left, I think this is one that uh, uh, Tim's uh, talk as well. Uh, and you can see the threshold. Uh, production of J size uh, as a function of photon energy. And uh, there's uh, no evidence of any of these uh, pentaquark peaks, uh, which may indicate that uh, the branching ratio to J size proton is actually quite small. And uh, that may be a clue to the actual internal structure of, of these uh, objects. Um, we completed an experiment uh, last year in Hall C. Um, 
using the super HMS and the HMS for positron and electron detection. Um, and I think they also have dimuon pairs. Uh, and uh, they have very nice JSI signatures, but we haven't seen uh, any analysis for the pentacorps yet. So, you know, maybe I think there's a talk at this meeting. Maybe we'll hear something new uh, then. Uh, the JLab Theory Center uh, continues its close coordination and collaboration with the experimental program, and. Uh, this is just kind of an overview slide, but there are three results from the last year down at the bottom. One is on nuclear structure, uh, GFMC calculations, the effective field theory interactions, and uh, a, uh, an analysis of uh, the, um, um, the uh, tensor moment in, in uh, uh, the proton in comparison with uh, the um, uh, lattice calculations, and on the right, there's a lattice calculation of the pion uh, structure function. Seeing lots of nice results coming out in theory. Uh, and uh, speaking of theory and experiment, we have the Virginia Senator, Center for Nuclear Pentography is uh, doing very well. This is funded by the Commonwealth of Virginia to facilitate the application of modern developments in data science to the problem of imaging and visualization structure protons, neutrons, and nuclei. Uh, we've got uh, several initiatives that were funded by Commonwealth of Virginia at the universities in collaboration with the lab and other people. Uh, these are multidisciplinary efforts bringing together people from many areas outside of nuclear physics. Um, we've recently appointed uh, Jang Gong Ji from the University of Maryland as the director and will be operating out of Sura uh, for this uh, center. And uh, you can see we held a workshop last year at Sura and they have a very nice facility uh, on the rooftop there in Washington, D.C. Uh, so with the PAC, PAC 47 was held last summer. Uh, this is the table of results. There was one experiment approved. Two received uh, C2 conditional approval. They have to come back to the PAC. The one is the K long uh, spectroscopy experiment, and the other is high precision measurement of lambda hyperhydrogens. Um, and uh, we had two deferrals, and we initiated the Jeopardy process. It went through these experiments that have been on the books since 2006 and 7 uh, in halls A and C. And um, the net result was that one experiment actually got its grade upgraded to A from A minus. And uh, one of them that was uh, not completed in Hall A is moving to Hall C, 26114. Um, but they were all granted uh, continuation status deputy program. So as a result of that, after that PAC, this is the table, uh, the latest table that I received from both ends um, that shows uh, we have 25.5 uh, total experiments completed in the program out of a total of 76. And uh, this is the updated uh, PAC days. Uh, see here again, as uh, Stuart pointed out, uh, that especially with solid, you have more than a decade of excellent science uh, in this program and uh, in all four halls. So we have uh, really uh, quite a robust program going forward. Um, the next PAC meeting is PAC 48. Uh, as you know, we delayed the due date and meeting to August 10th to 14th. Still I'm not sure if we could hold it uh, in person. Um, and uh, it will be quite a challenge to hold it remotely, but we may need to do that. I have some ideas on how to do that if, we, if it comes to it, but we'll see. Uh, a lot of the input to that depend, depends on what we see in the way of proposals, and that is, of course, the due date was today, so I haven't actually seen how many came in yet. Uh, we have a new chair, Marcus Deal. Very grateful to Jim Napolitano, who served for chair for uh, quite a few years, the last few years. Um, and we appointed new members, uh, Elke Aschenauer, 
Brookhaven, Shinya Sawada from KEK, and Constantina Sventi from Mainz, and Feng Yuan from uh, Berkeley Lab. Uh, and we will continue the Jeopardy process. Uh, so Stuart mentioned Muller, um, and uh, we had uh, earlier this year a director's review. Um, the uh, project manager, uh, Howard Fanker, retired right after that uh, director's review. We were very lucky that we were able to attract Jim Fast from uh, PNNL uh, to uh, come to JLab and uh, take up the project manager position for Mueller. Uh, and that's going very well. We have monthly calls with the Department of Energy and a uh, very good uh, very good communication with the department on this project. It's going well. They're planning for a CD1 review, uh, which is now scheduled by DOE September 22nd to 24th. Um, and that will be a major, major step for Mueller going forward. Um, we have um, most or all of the documentation completed and uh, I think they are in actually a very good strong position for the CD1 review so hopefully uh, that will go well and uh, Mueller will be off and running. Uh, solid, uh, we had a director's review last year, there were a few recommendations uh, and they came back and uh, revised their pre-CDR and the cost estimate. Um, and we submitted that proposal to the Office of Nuclear Physics in February, and as you heard from Tim, they're uh, anticipating a science review in the not too distant future, so they're thinking about scheduling, which is great. Um, meanwhile, we were working on uh, uh, setting up for ma uh, magnet tests of the 302 magnet. We've got all the steel uh, J Lab now from the, uh, the magnet. Um, and we want to do a test to really uh, verify that the magnet is in, is in good shape for the use with solid. Um, and the collaboration has been working on pre R and D projects listed there. Uh, I think they had some uh, some stuff in one of the halls uh, recently from the beam side. So. Of course, this has been interrupted now, but uh, hopefully they'll get they'll get moving again pretty soon. Uh, this is the new schedule. You haven't seen this. It's uh, it's it's been everyone it, everyone signed off on it, and it's up in the director's office right now. Uh, so we expect this to come out uh, any day now. Uh, and you can see. Um, in the four halls. This is now for FY20 and 21 and heading into FY22. Uh, in Hall A, you can see we complete CREX and then we go into installation of uh, SPS. Uh, and in Hall B, uh, we complete the bonus experiment uh, and then start up again after the shutdown. This is long shutdown, you can see, for the uh, 2K cold box uh, installation. Uh, and uh, then we start up again um, in, uh, I think it's roughly May of next year uh, with the heavy photon search and then electrons for neutrinos. In Hall C, we finish up the spin structure experiment, the D2N experiment that's on the floor now, and then switch to ion, LT cross sections, and form factors in uh, next year. Blue X phase two continues, and then we go to Primakov, uh, the Ada Primakov experiment, and the short range correlations, uh, photo production on nuclei uh, that was recently approved. Um, you can see at the bottom that, the, that there's the uh, 2K uh, cold box installation uh, that basically goes from uh, this September through May of next year, roughly. That uh, the length of that was extended because of the work restrictions associated with uh, COVID-19, so we expect that things will take a little longer. So, um, But you can see that we're running at 2.06 GeV per pass. Uh, we will be going down to 1.82 uh, GeV per pass uh, next year uh, to pick up these experiments that don't really require 
uh, higher energy. Um, and then uh, following that in FY22, uh, maybe Camille will uh, speak to this in the next talk, there's installation of lots of refurbished cryo modules that should get us back up to, I think, 11.6 GeV running again. And so uh, hopefully uh, this extensive work that will be done during this uh, coming shutdown uh, this year, going into next year, and then the following shutdown uh, involves quite a bit of uh, improvements in the accelerator. I suspect Camille will be talking about that. Uh, advanced computing initiatives, uh, Stuart mentioned that we're kind of moving out in this direction. We've, we've got the new division of uh, computational science and technology. Um, and these are three initiatives we've been working on. Uh, start to end experimental computing model uh, for 12 GeV and future EIC. Uh, computational and data science methodology for nuclear photography and machine learning for accelerator modeling and control. So a few things, of course, we had this AI for nuclear physics workshop that was mentioned earlier. Um, it was the last big meeting event at the lab before the uh, pandemic situation descended on us. And so we had over 180 attendees. It was really quite good. Actually, the report was just a, a week or so ago posted on the archive. Seen that. Um, we will be next year, uh, hopefully, if things settle down, hosting the uh, uh, Computing and High Energy and Nuclear Physics Conference. Uh, and uh, so that's, uh, that's going to be a big deal to bring that to Jefferson Lab. Um, and uh, you can see we've got streaming readouts tested simultaneously on seven class 12 systems. Integration of uh, LQCD results uh, as data source in global fits. Uh, LDRD is in progress on AI for accelerators. I'll show that in quantum simulation mini lecture series. I'll also mention that. Um, and um, so this is there's a lot of activity in this area. Here's some artificial intelligence and machine learning activities and theory. Uh, this is the Monte Carlo. Event generator uh, shown reproducing Pythia <coughs> on the right. Um, class 12 is using neural networks to determine the segments that belong to valid tracks. They can get 96% accuracy and a factor of six improvement in uh, speed for these types of events. And in accelerator, you can see this uh, AI is being used to diagnose and improve operational performance. This is the LDRD I mentioned earlier. Uh, there's a weekly lunch and learn uh, uh, meeting that was uh, being held, um, and um, got quite a bit of activity going on AI. I should mention there was a hackathon associated with that workshop that was quite interesting and quite successful. It's fun to see. Uh, quantum computing. Uh, Tim Hallman mentioned this. Um, there's, uh, you know, we have quite a few core strengths at Jefferson Lab that are useful for, uh, could be useful for quantum information science and sensing. I list them here. Uh, there was a lecture series funded in March, uh, by and held in March. It was funded by the Office of Nuclear Physics. Um, that was very successful. It ended up part of it was held in person, and then it switched over to remote. Um, there were uh, collaboration pre-proposals for uh, centers uh, for quantum computing. Um, the BNL and Yale, actually we were part of another one with uh, Livermore. Uh, the BNL one is going forward to the next level of review. I think we heard about that earlier. Um, and we have encouraged LDRD proposals. Actually, we have uh, five. Uh, proposals on QIS, and we're expanding the L LDRD program this year, so that there are more, there should be more funds available, and we hope to be able to jumpstart some uh, of the uh, uh, QIS activities at the laboratory in the next year. So, in summary, the 12 GV science program is underway, and will be again very soon, uh, bringing up the accelerator. Um, 
Warhol operation is now quite routine. Uh, we have this broad program of 76 group experiments, many opportunities for discovery, and uh, the initial science results are already being reported, and I, I mentioned some of those. Uh, future equipment projects, um, Muller uh, has CD0 and has an FY20 start and has the CD1 review coming up. And Solid is preparing for the DOE science review in addition to working on some uh, pre R&D. Uh, we anticipate a unique program for CBAF with fixed targets at the luminosity frontier that will be complementary to the EIC in the future. Uh, this, uh, Stuart mentioned we've had some uh, LOIs and proposals come in that uh, can help us uh, cement this in place. And so we we'll anticipate working on that in the near future and developing that. And we continue to develop advanced computation, including AI, ML, and QIS. Uh, and so that's all I have, and I'm glad to uh, answer any questions you might have. Turn it back to Kent, I guess. Thanks very much, Walt, for that nice presentation. Um, yeah, I want, so one uh, question uh, that's come up quickly um, was about the, the pack. So uh, Sylvia Nikolai is pointing out that um, at least as far as French institutions, uh, it, it seems likely that they, or at least so far, don't foresee to allow travel to the U.S. until sometime like January. So um, the possibility comes up of at least, even if the PAC's being held in person, at least need remote participation. And I'll just add to that that in the board, I know we've discussed uh, concerns with, uh, you know, if some users have to give remote presentations and others locally or something like this, we prefer to, you know, at least try to ensure that we have a, a uniform playing field, if you will, for the users and so on. There's some concerns about that. So I don't know if you have comments. Of course. Um, yeah, I haven't sorted through all of this yet. And now that we have the proposals in hand, I can see what the workload is going to be. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it's, you know, I'm anticipating that it's likely it will be a remote meeting. Yeah, these comments are useful. Uh, we need to. Uh, have a fair and level playing field for everyone. Um, and, uh, you know, even if we, I, I mean, I have the auditorium blocked out for that week, but I think even at the auditorium, uh, there are limitations on the number of people that can be in there at any given time. And uh, that's already tight. You have the committee and a few presenters and so forth. So um, it's not clear that logistically it could even work uh, in person. So uh, now my my target was once we get the proposals, which was today, uh, we can start a serious discussion of how we're going to do this. And I already just saw an email from one of the PAC members already <laughs> wondering what's going on. So uh, give right. us a little bit of time to work this out. Yeah, it's going to be easy. Good. Yeah, I'll just make the point also being um, uh, on the board, we've already communicated a little bit about how this meeting will happen. So uh, we appreciate you, you know, giving us a chance mm -hmm. to try to provide feedback. Um, so mm -hmm. if there's other concerns, I'm sure you'd like users to get in touch with you. Of course, they can also get in touch with their uh, board member to try to collate that information. Yeah, that, the um, whole idea of laying the due date kind of started with a few informal inquiries to me. And then I thought maybe the board should discuss it and get a broader uh, perspective from the users, and, and so I think that that was a good discussion, and a good way to handle that. So, you know, I'm glad it worked out. So, we'll see. Uh, we're not we're not through it yet. It's going to be a challenge. Okay. Um, I don't see any other questions coming in there. Um, if we're not going to get flagged down, I think we should go ahead and move ahead to try to preserve some of the lunch time. So thanks very much for the nice okay, presentation. Thank you. Thank you. And I think now we're going to try to bring up uh, Camille's. Uh, uh, yes, I'm here. Excellent. Good. Good to hear from you. And are you able to share? I will try. Got your video. Uh, 
Okay. Uh -huh. Do you see a presentation? I do. I think if it goes right, it's in full screen, so I think we're ready to go. All right. Thank you very much. I'll get it. Right. So um, I'm here to give the presentation on the CBAF performance and outlook. Um, I'm the director of accelerator operations since August last year and the CPP project director. So the outline of my talk includes the CBAF status, operational experience and plans, um, and some selected planned improvements, kind of sticking high level there, uh, just going over a few of the topics. Um, the CBAF performance plan is a big deal. Um, that is intended to improve our reliability and energy reach in the machine. Uh, we have a targeted system prioritization. We have existing monitoring tools that help us with that prioritization. Um, and then I've just selected a few medium and longer term upgrades to talk about. Uh, and then I want to talk about uh, our most recent shutdown, um, how that went, and then the plans for the upcoming shutdown, which uh, somebody probably, Stuart, mentioned was supposed to happen early May, so it's just delayed. Uh, but I'll start with the schedule. So pandemic response, uh, this is has just a little bit of a different slant to what, uh, what Stuart showed. Um, we were transitioned to so-called MedCon 6, meaning um, minimum operations uh, in between the 24th of March and the 8th of June. Um, luckily, the laboratory had in place already a pandemic protection and response plan. Of course, this was nothing like anybody had ever experienced before. Um, but I wanna say this combined with the experience from hurricanes uh, really helped us to be able to shut down cleanly and safely. Um, uh, MedCon 6 is defined as a widespread pandemic throughout the US. All right, so yeah, we ceased our operations, moving to a minimum safe state, basically sending everybody home who could go home. Uh, we warmed up the central helium liquefier to 4K and transferred excess helium to Dewar, so there was not a significant loss of helium. We were able to keep the crown modules cold at 4K and the beam lines under vacuum, which is important for maintenance of the crown module performance. Uh, we have, over that whole time, had uh, low conductivity water, uh, power, HVAC in a holiday configuration, and so on. So when I go to my office, it's not freezing cold. It's pretty nice temperature. I like that. Uh, but I guess that will change. Um, We've had a critical computing systems available, uh, computing both in the uh, lab computing and also accelerator computing did a great job of making sure that uh, people could maintain their ability to work pro product pro productively from home. Uh, so I was very pleased with how that went. Uh, the lab distributed laptops, um, we made sure that people had uh, network accessibility and so on. Uh, so folks stayed home to the extent that they could, worked from home. Uh, we exercised online tools like we never had before. Um, and basically, people came into the lab only in case there was an operational emergency. We had, on average, uh, about 64 people on a work day come to the laboratory. And that means whether they come for five minutes or stay all day, uh, we don't determine that. But it's about 65 people total. Um, to make sure that folks knew what was going on with respect to operations, we had a weekly meeting. We used the weekly Wednesday operations meeting, uh, of course, via Blue Jeans. And we did have Hall staff integrated into that meeting, which I think was quite successful. And now we have an ongoing restart, which I'm describing here. This is just a rough estimate. Nobody has done this kind of pandemic uh, recovery before, and so we have redone a lot of our, the vast majority of our um, procedures and processes to make sure that people don't need to be close to each other, um, but if they do need to be close to each other, that they have um, the appropriate new kinds of PPE, which also requires additional training. Uh, so we've really tried to avoid that where possible, um, but we have it and we can use it when, when we do need it. So right now we're doing a lot of uh, preventive maintenance that was not emergency uh, and so that was delayed during MedCon 6 now that we're at MedCon 5 uh, that's proceeding 
Um, we are planning to pump down uh, the cryo to uh, 2K and fill the crown modules next week. Uh, we'll start closing up and checking out the systems after the July 4th weekend. We plan to restart the machine with Beam in mid-July and get Beam back to the halls the last week of July. And I just want to remind everybody that safety comes first, and so we are regularly instructing our staff that safety comes before schedule if they have any concerns that perhaps a procedure was not addressing um, uh, social distancing rules properly or anything like that, that they stop work and uh, bring it to the attention of their supervisor before continuing. Okay, so this is a high level of uh, operational priorities and plans. Uh, we intend to re reach 12 GEV uh, in five and a half passes uh, in normal operation and we are expecting steady progress this year. I'm going to go into that in more detail. Um, one thing which was new to me, I want to say since late last year, is that we will revisit the limitations on the total current which constrain the Hall's A and C experiments. We think we can increase it. We had intended to do an exploratory study at the end of this run, uh, meaning uh, late April. Uh, that, of course, did not happen. I do intend to reschedule that, but I don't have a good time right now. But it is important, I know, to Hall's A and C uh, to see what we can do about that. Um, about high gradient, of course, it would be great to get to 12 Jeff, but if we have an enormous trip rate, nobody will be happy. Um, and also the heat load to the cryogenic system can choke the whole system, making it inoperable for experiments. So uh, both of these activities, the trip rates and the choking of the cryo system are related to field emission and cryo modules. Um, and uh, we are aware that physics prefers steady running to short-term gradient reach with a high trip rate. And so we're trying to optimize all of these things at once, which is not easy, uh, but uh, this is what we do. So the main issues uh, that are on my mind to ensure high quality physics output is to mitigate the field emission and crown modules, reduce the trip rates and reduce the downtimes. And we do have uh, excellent data monitoring tools and so we can target the low hanging fruit and most troublesome components um, effectively. We are following the CVAC performance plan, which is already in place, um, in particular with respect to critical spares, obsolescent components, and energy reach. Uh, we are in the progress of updating the CPP this year with recent data and accomplishments, and I have a little bit more on that uh, later on. Uh, we also uh, are working to improve crown module performance. This is a multi-pronged effort as well. We want to install better crown modules through the CPP energy reach. Uh, we want to reduce the particulates in the warm sections between crown modules. We want to monitor the field emission induced radiation to better understand the impact of what improvements we do make. And we have other assorted development work. Um, something that came up in the last run was we had kind of high beam losses, especially in the East Arc, and we want to reduce beam losses. Um, it, turns out that we can improve our diagnostics instrumentation and do some beam studies. Uh, and some of that happened already, it was successful, uh, but I expect this to uh, take a higher level of uh, scrutiny uh, coming up. Um, also, with respect to shutdowns and, and recovering problems, we wanna make uh, recovery faster and also more reproducible. And we can do that by improving our work processes um, improving the procedures so that they're more reproducible and also uh, through planning. So a word on our momentum choice for the ongoing run. Uh, our primary goal is to provide stable high energy running with the same or lower trip rate through continual improvement. So our capability estimate um, and what we're defining by margin is to keep the RF trip rates below four per hour and the cryo load not choked. So as of November last year, at the beginning of the current run, uh, we had 1042 MeV over C in the North Lenac and 1095 in the South. So uh, we, of course, had to do some simulations to ensure that we had um, proper 
um, polarization. But uh, by doing that, we made a conservative estimate to make sure that we could keep, that we were fairly confident that we could keep the same uh, uh, beam, beam energy uh, throughout the run uh, by selecting 1031 MeV over C in each LINAC. Um, the injector adds another 120 MeV over C. Um, and also note that the three hulls have greater, the A, B, and C have greater than 98% of cathode polarization. So it would be great if we had more gradient overhead, and that's the goal of the energy reach program of the CPP that would reduce the trip rate. So because we can turn down prob problematic cavities um, and turn up other ones if we have that margin. The plan for 21, um, as uh, Bob told you, we have a plan. Uh, it's been submitted to the director. So it's not final, final, but this is what we, what I think is going to happen. So physics wants 10.9 GeV in five and a half passes. That's 980 MeV over C per LINAC. Um, the capability estimate, um, meaning the margin, as of the end of March uh, was updated. It was 1019 MeV over C in the North LINAC, 1072 in the South. So both degraded um, since the beginning of the run. So in the North, we currently assuming that we're going back to the same operation uh, that we left in March, which is our plan. We have a, a negative margin. It doesn't mean we can't run. It just means we're running with higher trip rate. Uh, so Jay Benish did an updated analysis uh, for all of calendar year 19. Uh, what it shows in the C20s and the C50s is overall a 19 MeV over C for Linux degradation. Um, this is consistent with what uh, Arne Freiberger and others, Jay included, many other people um, found uh, from the data when they made this 2015 CPP proposal. So it's statistically consistent with what we had before, no change. That can be good or bad. Um, but what I want to say is the planned momentum choice of 980 um, is feasible. So this is the reliability for FY20 so far. We did better in FY19. Um, what you see in the plot on the left, and I don't know if you can see my cursor, but um, the, this is the week start date. And each of those blue points corresponds to a week. And then the vertical uh, axis is the reliability in percent. 80% is what the DOE specs, expects from us. That's the dashed line. Um, the red dotted areas just show where we were not running because we were in a scheduled shutdown. Um, but you can see that we started out pretty rough for several weeks getting going in the FY20 run, um, but we started to do really well um, around mid-February and just were going up, 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 up until we had to turn off. So that was disappointing, but we were getting almost to 90% uh, close to the end. If we can reproduce that, that would be great. Um, the reliability itself, you probably know, but it's defined as the hour, hours delivered divided by the hours scheduled. So on, a week has 168 hours, but it has 164 scheduled hours, so we take out four for maintenance. Um, and then we expect 144 of those to, to be for nuclear physics, um, and that's negotiated with exper experimenters, and the rest is split, as you see here. So as I said, for FY19, we were over 80%, which was awesome. Um, but for FY20, our average is 74%. Of course, that's incomplete because we're going to do another six-week run. Um, some of the issues that go into a lower reliability include beam losses and beam steering that's required. Uh, we had a couple of very tricky targets in halls A and C, a calcium-48 target, and then a glass-structured target that couldn't have a high temperature gradient. Um, we also had some component failures, and we also had a safety stand down due to several problems. Uh, many things came together, and we just needed to stop and uh, talk to people about um, some common elements that we were seeing uh, that were leading to safety violations. Fortunately, nobody was hurt, uh, but we were worried that that could be a precursor to somebody getting hurt, and we don't want that, so stop and think. So we, we did miss some uh, beam time for that. All right, so we're able to do a downtime analysis by system, and this is just giving you a high-level picture of it. The downtime manager uh, shows us that 
Beam transport is something like 30 to 40 percent, depending on the gradient configuration. And the RF downtime is 30 to 40 percent, depending on the gradient configuration. Um, and I'll tell you, beam transport is kind of a catch all. It includes tuning, but if there's something that the operators don't really know what the problem was, it gets thrown in there. So it's a little bit unfair, but it is a big category um, and we need to poke at it and try to reduce it. Um, RF downtime is the vertical slice of superconducting RF, RF power and vacuum associated with CROW modules and specifically C20 and C50 CROW modules. Um, the magnets and power supplies have pretty consistently been around 10% and there are many other systems that are less than 10%. And it's easy to say, okay, magnets 10%, but that's a lot of different systems that are associated with magnets. So there's not really any low hanging fruit there. Um, I'll just mention that when we had the low energy configuration last year, uh, we had more gradient overhead. So that put less stress on the RF, um, but it required more tuning because we had this unfamiliar machine configuration. Um, so it was a trade off last year uh, between the low energy and high energy running with respect to RF and beam transport. Some numbers there. Okay, so the CVP energy plan, this is evolving and it's regularly updated. This is a plot that uh, has been shown to the DOE uh, last year, some time ago. So don't look too much at the detail, but here's some, some things that I want you to look at. Um, we add a CRAW module and it increases the energy reach. Um, and then the crown module performance degrades over time. We add another one or more crown modules. It increases the energy reach and the crown modules that are there uh, degrade over time. So that's what that sawtooth looks like. Um, our goal is shown in yellow here. We want 1190 MeV over C per Linux. Um, and as I've said, the reliability is directly connected to the energy margin. And the way we get improvement is to increase energy reach by adding crown modules um, as well as an energy margin um, and by reducing the degradations. We have a number of um, initiatives aimed at reducing degradation. The main elements of the energy plan are new crown modules called C75s, which are expected to have a gradient reach of about 70 MeV. Um, C100 refurbishment, so the crown modules removed from the from the uh, LINAC and then the cavities are cleaned and everything is cleaned up and it's put back together. Um, plasma processing is a relatively new technique that could in principle, if proven, uh, clean up crown modules in situ. Uh, liquid nitrogen cleaning, same thing. Liquid nitrogen is more uh, black, has more of an ability to blast particles whereas uh, plasma processing uh, deals with hydrocarbons that have absorbed on the surfaces. Um, and then uh, North Linac refurbishment is another big part of it, and I'm going to talk about that in some detail. So this is the overall schedule, uh, which you saw. Again, a couple of uh, main factors to look at. The red are the physics runs. Um, the blue, bluish grayish is the SAD. And then we have here the run energy, 11.4 right now, 10.9 next year, 11.6 the following year, and then 12 eventually. Um, and then what you see a little further below is what our plan is for exactly which crown modules we're going to install and, and remove. So at the moment, of course, COVID-19 has an impact that's not entirely known. Um, and we are estimating that the cold box replacement for cryo, uh, the duration is going to be increased by 25% um, because of the use of PPE and social distancing. Anyway, so there are some uh, changes that have been included here, but that we've had to include, and uh, and we'll see how it goes. But this is our best estimate right now. Um, this just shows which crown modules we're intending to uh, deal with. The uh, we're going to take this one out. It's 25 MeV right now. It's a C50 and we're gonna replace it with the brand new C75. I'm very much looking forward to seeing what the performance of the C75 is uh, in situ in the accelerator. Take uh, this C100 out, replace it with P1. And then I think we're still discussing, but uh, our baseline plan is to remove the C100 that's at uh, 1L26. 
that we lose 37 MeV by doing that and just replace it with beam pipe for now um, and then uh, refurbish it on a longer time scale. So this is a description of the energy reach and um, and I've said many of these things. A couple of things I want to say is that the C100 that was installed last year, it reached 98, at least 98 MeV. It's the best, when it was installed, it was the best uh, crown module in CBAF, and that gives us some confidence in our plan. Um, we have some updates to the CBAF performance plan. I mentioned already Jay's updated analysis. Um, we also have a uh, implementation summary from Randy about uh, the replacement of obsolescent components and the procurement of spares, plystrons, magnets are all in much better shape than when we started. Um, we also are working on energy reach optimization, uh, targeting field emission, and um, and continually monitoring and maintaining components so that they don't uh, cause us trouble. This is a picture of a girder, which happened, which. They are located in between crown modules. There's a crown module on the left and a crown module on the right. Uh, they have valves in them. I wanted to show you, this is what a good valve looks like. It would go, if you can see my cursor right here, and there's one on the other side as well. I think this one is a little easier to see. And it goes in and this black thing, this is a seal and it uh, touches a beam pipe and it seals it up. So you can't put beam through. And you also uh, can keep vacuum on one side. and uh, bleed up to air cleanly on the other side. Unfortunately, we pulled out a bad valve last year, and you can see this black powder. That's what's left of the Viton seal that used to be there. So we believe we have pretty good indication that this is due to radiation uh, hardening, and then uh, and then it just turns into powder when you slam it into the beam pipe. So it was definitely not good to have um, those particles of Viton sitting around. There's been quite a lot of study. Uh, of the particulates on the girders that are pulled out and replaced and cleaned, cleaned then replaced. Uh, there's a couple of papers that are shown here, but what we saw is that there's a lot of large particulates, large meaning more than 10 microns, of assorted kinds of metals that we know are in there, copper, titanium, uh, minerals, and also elastomer and polymer materials. So uh, we are doing a big replacement uh, called the North Atlantic refurbishment, which is here. So we know that the crown module performance degrades over time. It's been fairly consistent from the 2015 paper until um, the most recent analysis, but we don't really know why. We we can't say causally what exactly has happened happening, but we know we see some evidence of radiation damage. We know that having bits of viton in there is not a good thing. That's obvious, but you know how that leads directly to performance is difficult. Um, but we're addressing the de degradation with a three-pronged approach. First, monitoring the field emission as a function of time. Um, the photon detectors that we usually use are not rad hard. We kill them quickly. Um, and so physics, uh, radiation physics, has developed a new rad hard neutron detector um, that was developed internally. So pretty excited about that. We're going to install a bunch of them at key locations in the tunnel. We may end up putting in more if they perform as expected. Um, but that should be able to give us uh, radiation as a function of time. Um, we're also uh, starting a new task force to improve materials and installation processes and procedures. Um, it's just it's time to update those things. It's not that, that you know things were done badly, things were done in the way that they uh, needed to be done at the time, but the machine's been running for decades now and it's time to update stuff. And we're replacing faulty components. So those Viton valves. Uh, are going to be replaced in the whole North Linux. We have a great opportunity right now because of the cold box replacement uh, for CHL1 that the entire North Linux is going to be warm to room temperature for months. And so we're going to take advantage of that and uh, replace some faulty components. So uh, those of you who work in halls B and D already know that we had a hysteresis problem uh, that was causing an irreproducible final focus spot size for hall B um, by so Mike Tiefenbach figured this out. Uh, by updating the ramp rate, uh, we were able to have an improved uh, final focus reproducibility in B and D. So this reduces tuning time. As I've mentioned before, that's something that we want to target um, and it thereby increases machine reliability. So happy about this uh, improvement. 
we had a shutdown over the holidays and we called it a soft shutdown because we left a lot of things on. Uh, the, the purpose of calling it a soft shutdown and doing things a little bit differently was uh, to try to reduce the startup difficulties and it worked pretty well. So we kept the enclosure locked up, systems on and the control room staffed throughout the holiday period. You could ask some of the staff whether they thought that was a good idea to have to work over the holidays or not. I think it was mixed. Um, but the goal was to keep the temperature approximately constant in the tunnel, and that minimizes the variation to the beam orbits uh, and makes startup and tuning much faster and easier. And also avoiding power cycles to delicate equipment um, preserves their lifetime. So we were able to restart the physics program earlier than scheduled, and uh, we were able to deliver free beam to Hall B. And so Hall B was happy with this at least. And uh, so we'll use this as a learning experience for future shutdowns. This is the long shutdown. It was supposed to be from May to December, and it's just been shifted, probably starting in September instead, as Stuart said. Uh, uh, we'll see. The big one is to replace the coal box. Um, the existing one is not considered reliable anymore. Uh, we have a new one. It's been finished and it's ready to go. Uh, we're doing part one of two of the injector upgrade for Muller. Uh, and then we're gonna uh, do a crown module dance that includes the two crown modules I uh, told you already, as well as the North Lenac refurbishment, the replacement of some valves and some bellows in the beam line and cleaning a lot of different components there. So in summary, our performance in FY19 exceeded the requirements, but FY9, FY20, unfortunately not yet. Um, I'm not sure if it's, arithmetically possible to get to 80% at this point, but uh, let's let's just try how close we can get. We have a good strategy in place for improving the CVAC performance um, that I'm excited about. Uh, we can take advantage of existing tools um, and existing plans and existing studies to set our priorities in the short term, and we have uh, some great ideas for addressing the fundamental issues longer term. Um, and I want to thank the excellent communication with experimental leadership. Um, I think that our concerns are addressed and our inter interferences are negotiated pretty well. We had some tough times with some of those targets uh, early in this run, um, but it was overall very positive. And I just really want to thank the run coordinators, um, the hall leaderships, halls leaderships, um, and the physics division leadership for their help to make this really work well. So that's it. Thank you, Camille, um, for that. We're running um, pretty late, but I'm reluctant to delay the afternoon program because um, because the business meeting for the um, we have a number of important issues for the business meeting for the board that will be pushed too deep into the night for the Europeans. I think if we push off. So um, let's just take a question real quick. Um, one was asked by uh, Carlos Munoz, and it's something that's maybe related to I think a, a general concern from users. Um, he's asking whether or not the reliability is taking into account um, when beam scheduled to multiple halls. If if uh, one of the halls, you know, can't receive beam, if that's how that's counted in that, um, it's and not. whether there's right, and whether there's maybe other statistics that could be used or reported to try to you know capture that information. Yeah. Um... There are, and Andre has a presentation that, show, in fact, we have a standard plot that shows uh, all of the halls running at the same time, whether they're running at the same time or not. Um, but no, it doesn't go into the performance that we report to the DOE. Um, I would be hesitant to do that, uh, but it doesn't mean that we can't internally use it as a, as a measure, um, but we haven't so far, no. Yeah, I certainly would support using internal measures that are not necessarily reported to the DOE because I think that there's lots of different ways to capture the information, um, and you don't want to you don't want to put yourself on the hook for all of it. Uh, but it's useful to sort of better understand what's happening if you try some of these different techniques. Um, you know, it's a little well, bit that's... tricky. Sometimes, uh, sure. sometimes one hall will go down to change a target or for some other reason, some upgrade. I don't know. Uh, and so you wouldn't want that to be marked as somehow a black X against accelerator operations. So you'd have to be a little bit careful about how you categorize those kinds of 
uh, efficiencies or whatever you want to call it. Sure, but and I think ultimately, you know, uh, we're not so much thinking of um, of black X so much as it is just trying to keep track of what's what's happening. But well, exactly. It, you have to kind of understand what the source is, if it's on purpose or not. Of course. Um, but I guess I was a touch confused also by your description that, you know, you had downtimes related to of like 30, 40 percent related to RF trip rates and that sort of thing. Um, but at the same time, you're reporting a total uptime of 75, okay. sometimes 80 percent. So. No, no, I meant of the total downtime, 30 percent oh, was due okay. time. I understand. Yeah. Real quickly, then, I'll address the, second, the last question that came in from uh, Stefan Spanian, um, uh, where he's referring to the microstructure in beam intensity. Um, so you get like a non-CW component, by which what I think he means is that there's a, a lot of, you know, sort of bunching in the RF structure, not the RF bunching, but beyond that. So do you have anything to say about that? I think we made great progress. I think it's not perfect, but uh, we'll continue to work with the Hall B folks to, to try to improve it. I do think it's okay. improved. I think it's improved, right? I was. Do you know the source of it? I, I don't know. I'm, I'm out of the loop. Can you just make a comment on where it's coming from? You think? Uh, um, we think it goes back to the source, and we did some work um, with the source. And no, I don't know, but it does. It goes all the way back to the beginning of the machine. Laser laser structure, or you don't? Yeah. We don't have it information. So we might be able to fix it by replacing the lasers with other kinds of lasers. That's that's one proposal. All right. Thank you very much for the uh, uh, answer to that, for the nice presentation. Are there other questions? And if not, then we have a little less than a half hour uh, to come back for our afternoon session. But I think we'll keep that schedule as it is. Okay. I see a question from Stefan. I'm sorry? I see a question from Stefan. Uh, that was the one we just asked, Lorelai. Okay. That was the one we just discussed. Yeah. Okay. Um, so thanks very much, uh, and we'll be back here at uh, 1 o'clock to continue. Thank you to Camille and uh, also Bob and Jim for the morning's, that's the morning's talks. See you soon. For those of you who are still on, I think we may stop broadcast uh, for a little bit of time. I'm not sure that we'll do that, but if so, uh, be sure the meeting is not ending. It's simply going on pause for a short period.